Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show on iTunes, or use our RSS feed with your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter, Instagram, and SoundCloud at vmspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, and on Tumblr at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com. You can support this podcast and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. Every week you'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my monthly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. Now we're going to flash back to the Bush administration. I uh, hope a lot of you, well, you should remember it. Um, back then, there was this neoconservative newspaper startup. It was actually a reboot of a really, really old newspaper. It was called the New York Sun. And it tagged along with our office's Wall Street Journal subscription for a few years. Um, it was usually tossed out unread, uh, but I opened it up on a whim one morning. And I skipped the main news section and opened to the arts and culture pages because, you know, that's who I am. Um, and when I got to pages two and three, I think, that's where I found facing articles on the publication of Gershom Sholem's notebooks and the potential impact of Pau Gasol's trade to the L.A. Lakers, both with big photo spreads, too. And I thought, is it possible that I've gone Tyler Durden and when I think I'm asleep, I'm, I'm actually editing this newspaper's culture section? Because this is really a specific set of interests, pretty much a demographic of Gill, which is, of course, this podcast also. Now, I had the same vibe a few months ago when I saw the advance word about the new book from this week's guest, George Prochnik. Now, George has already written a, a wonderful book that was right up my alley about Stefan Zweig called The Impossible Exile. And we recorded a show about that in 2014. And now he's back with Stranger in a Strange Land, searching for Gershom, Sholem, and Jerusalem. And I am once again wondering if I have a second, much more intelligent, better writing persona who comes out due to my lack of sleep. See, uh, Sholem is this, for those of you who don't know, famed scholar of, of the Jewish mystical tradition, Kabbalah. And he was also a pre-independent settler in Palestine. I have, um, I have thumbed through a copy of his book, Kabbalah, for a couple of decades now, uh, mainly for literary devices that I can fail to employ in the fiction that I fail to write. Um, in Stranger, which is a book that was actually written, uh, which is also from other press, by the way, just like The Impossible Exile. George writes about Sholem's development as a thinker and his intricate and, and frustrating relationship with, with the doomed philosopher Walter Benjamin. Um, then there's the, the historical sweep of Europe beginning in World War I, uh, the evolution of Zionism, both as a concept and as a reality, uh, especially after Israel becomes a state. And Sholem's discovery and exploration of the various threads of Kabbalah, as well as the, the literary influences that, that informed him. Um, George also closes out each chapter with his own story about moving to Israel in the 1980s with his wife at the time, uh, starting a family, trying to become a scholar, and the way Sholem's work affected him during that span. And he doesn't shirk from depicting the 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 willful blindness to the lives of Palestinians when he was there. But he frames it in the Jerusalem that Sholem lived in from the mid-1920s until his death in 1982. The book portrays a fascinating life, and, and George is careful not to draw too many parallels to his own experience. Because in some respects, the intifada that George lived through wasn't imaginable to Sholem, I think. Anyway, Stranger in a Strange Land is a wonderful book that taught me a lot about the, the mystical tradition in Judaism, 
the guy who is responsible for making it a subject of academic study, the limits of human imagination and the, the time leading up to the Holocaust, and a lot more. Um, it's a very honest portrayal of a marriage falling apart also. Uh, it's, it's a really amazing piece of work. I honestly just can't wait for George's follow-up on the Gasol era in L.A., now, uh, there were no major audio caveats for this one, although there is a meta caveat that struck me uh, as I was listening to the previous conversation I had with George and then editing this one. Um, and that is this. The subjects of George's work are so fascinating to me in that demographic of one that I, I have tended to neglect to talk to George about his own life and influences because there's so much to talk about from either Stefan Zweig or now Gershom Scholem and everything that goes into both of those books. Uh, we did have a nice time shooting the breeze in an offhand way after I put the mics away, um, but I get the feeling there's a, a non-new book conversation that George and I need to record sometime. I hope he's up for it. Anyway, here's George's bio. George Prochnik's previous book, The Impossible Exile, Stefan Zweig at the End of the World, received the National Jewish Book Award for Biography and Memoir in 2014 and was shortlisted for the Wingate Prize in the UK. Prochnik is also the author of In Pursuit of Silence, Listening for Meaning in a World of Noise, from 2010, and Putnam Camp, Sigmund Freud, James Jackson Putnam, and the Purpose of American Psychology, in 2006. He has written for The New York Times, The New Yorker, Book Forum, and the L.A. Review of Books, and is editor-at-large for Cabinet Magazine. His new book is Stranger in a Strange Land, Searching for Gershom Sholem and Jerusalem, from Other Press. And now, the new Virtual Memories Conversation with George Prochnik. So when we talked three years ago, George, we... um. We were talking about Stefan Zweig and the optimism that um, Bildung, that, that, you know, a culture would raise the masses and keep them from making terrible political decisions. Do you think it was possibly the worst, you know, uh, prediction we made or anyone else has made in the last couple of years as far as the, the effects of culture in the world? <laughs> well, um, I think that I think that we're seeing now the effects of the absence of culture, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think the, the problem is that we have such a diffuse and um, distracted and contracted exposure to culture through such a multiplicity of, of platforms and, and um, mediums that the, our capacity to absorb anything in the substantive way that someone like Zweig was extolling as the path to preserving civilization's treasures has been itself really shattered and dispersed. Um, so I think that in fact what we're seeing is exactly the consequence of not having sub sufficient emphasis on Bildung in the Zweigian sense. Okay, that's a good place for us to start with, so I don't feel as bad, um, because a year later I was goofing on a political cartoonist who was actually worried about where things were going, and I told him I would be stupid. And Even early 2015, when I recorded with Harold Bloom, he was, um, or 16, I guess, uh, recording with Bloom, he was reading It Can't Happen Here. And I said, oh, for God's sake, Professor Bloom, of course it can't happen here. And he, yeah, everybody knew better than me, I guess. That's, that's the big lesson of this podcast. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, but tell me about the, the new book. Tell me what the origin point was for Stranger in a Strange Land. Right. Well, I, I'd say that it had um, several different origin points. In a, in a personal way, um, I lived in Jerusalem for almost 10 years uh, between the summer of 1987 and uh, 1996. And I have searched for a long time for ways of exploring and, I guess, animating what those years were to me and what my experience of the city was. It's hard to do a portrait of a city. And in fact, I went there partly under the influence of Gershom Scholem, who was an extraordinary scholar, not just of Jewish mysticism, but really of what the tradition of Judaism as a lived experience consisted in, and for him, very much a living question, what it might become in the future. And I had been reading his books um, while I was living, actually, in a in a very remote 
a place in the on the west coast of Ireland, a place called the Burren. Um, if you don't know it, it's almost a lunar landscape, very unusual, very unusual geological formation. Some botanists know it because it has an extraordinary abundance of different orchid species. Uh, but I was there in a cottage with no electricity, no running water, very, very simple, old, whitewashed cottage. And what took you there? What took me there was uh, my then-wife's stepmother has, had been a hippie, and she'd bought this house in the 60s, and it was there to be to be lived in for nothing, which was very appealing mm-hmm. as a writer. Yeah. And it's very, very beautiful, although mm-hmm. very, very stark and, and hard. Um, and there, having read Walter Benjamin and through Benjamin, uh, his letters is an extraordinary correspondence with Sholem become interested in what Sholem's own work was, I began to really go through some of Sholem's most famous texts, and the major trends in Jewish mysticism, which was a survey of the whole history of Jewish mysticism that he delivered originally as a series of lectures in New York and then turned into a book at the end of the 19... The lectures were delivered in the end of the 1930s and then it became a book in 1941, I believe. Um, and also uh, a, a book called On the Kabbalah and Its Symbolism, which has a, a series of, again, essays that began as lectures. These delivered at a conference called the Iranos Conference that Jung had had begun, um, although Jung wasn't wasn't living or wasn't at least in, in shape to participate by the time uh, Sholem began going. But these, this, this conference always intrigued me because I know that sometimes scholars would deliver lectures for five, six hours at a time. There, was, there were no, there were no Real limits. Real Fidel Castro sort of thing? Is that a- Real <laughs> Castro with a, with, a, with a level of erudition in obscure texts that I don't think he had. But so I, I, um, I had been so... It personally, and in in terms of my understanding of what Jewish history consisted of, so inspired and um, I guess intrigued by all the direct, different directions Sholem opened up, that I wanted to take that further. So he was a he was an an actual motivation uh, to me in terms of getting to Jerusalem. I I wanted to be in the place that his work centered on in a conceptual sense, if if not a literal sense. And I wanted also to um, have a chance to think about this experience in Jerusalem itself. So after doing this five book, I was very aware of how, of course, of how disastrous uh, Zweig's own exile had been. I mean, although he was couldn't have been more uh, conscious that disaster was coming, he left, he left, his his native Austria in 1934. So after Hitler became chancellor in Germany, but four years before the Anschluss, he had departed for England. But Zweig had no, he had no destination. Um, And this, it became clear to me, was a recipe for disaster in what I came to think of as a kind of Lot's wife syndrome. If you don't know where you're going, it doesn't matter how fast you're running, you're going to be looking back over your shoulder often. And Sholem is uh, really an antithetical figure. He felt that Jewish history as a living project was done in Germany already in the 1920s. He felt that because of the intense assimilationist urge on the one hand and the ways that that desire to be part of German culture promoted um, an, an embrace of German, not just German nationalism, but German mili- jingoism in its most uh, extreme um, iterations. He felt that the Jews were destroying the, val- the, the core values of the culture. It wasn't mm-hmm. only that nobody knew the text themselves anymore, but that the ethical principles that had made Judaism great were being absolutely eviscerated in this um, early modernist, uh, emerging modernist culture of Berlin in the 1920s. So he left for then Palestine, for Jerusalem, with, in his mind, a real one-way ticket. And in fact, his memoir that he wrote when he was elderly is called From Berlin to Jerusalem. It's Mm. It's as he pre- as he presents it, a very straight vector. Things are, of course, more nuanced in reality, but uh, it was a very successful, um, if not a, a self-exile, in yeah. fact, 
that that Sholem did. And so he was an interesting he was an interesting bookend to the story of Zweig. Zweig has this crazily meandering exile that takes him first to London and then to Bath, England, and then to New York, and then from New York to Ossining, New York, where he writes the first draft of his memoir, The World of Yesterday, and then from there he goes to Rio de Janeiro, and then from Rio he goes to Petropolis, where he ends up killing himself. So Zweig was zigzagging all over the globe, and Scholem, so it didn't matter how fast he, he fled, uh, he wasn't going to find where he was looking for because it didn't exist. It was right. an imaginary conceit, and Sholem was the opposite. Yeah, and and that sense of the, um, I, I think you mentioned it in the book, that uh, Franz Rosenzweig uh, says that Sholem was returning home. Like, none of us understood that he knew from the beginning he's returning home and he's doing it alone. Right, that that's that, that, that codicil that you put there being, the, to mm. me, the critical point, that he, he was, Rosenzweig said, of that generation of, of really, he was thinking of Central Europeans who made Aliyah, who moved to uh, Jerusalem. Sholem was the only one who went home, but he went home alone. And, and that says something about the incredible idiosyncrasy of his Zionism and also something about his solitariness as, as a soul, I think, mm. in a more expansive sense. And one of the interesting things, and it's the way the book is structured, it's largely Sholem's history, each chapter, and then closing out with your own story, you and your wife mm-hmm. uh, in, in Jerusalem. Um, one of the things that's interesting to me throughout the, the progression of the book, with those sections notwithstanding, is the way that Sholem's theoretical Zionism runs up against the practical realities mm-hmm. of we have to form a state right. and people actually have to be part of this. And it's not simply, you know, again, high modernist theorizing uh, about this um, and that you you and your wife are living through the aftermath of that in a sense uh, in, in the 80s and 90s. Um, how natural was that for you to, to, to capture? Like how well were you able to, to do that or get some perspective on it, I suppose? Get some perspective specifically on... Yours and and seeing through your experience what Sholem was going through when the the second wave essentially uh, was, was changing what Zionism was in front of him. Right. Well, I think that's a, I think that's a, a very good question. And in, in fact, uh, the book evolved only when these different parallels and even when not uh, direct correlations, these echoes between these different historical periods became more and more overwhelmingly present to me. Um, you know, critically, with with Sholem's initial embrace of Zionism, and he began calling himself a Zionist in 1911 when he was all of 14 years old. Mm-hmm. But what Zionism meant then is has very little to do with all of the different um, connotations that the that the movement, that the term has today. I mean, political Zionism as an idea was incredibly nascent at best. It was really a germinal thought. And, there, and Sholem initially considered himself um, a, a cultural Zionist. Yeah. He had an idea that he himself should get to Jerusalem where he would meet like-minded Jews, and in some fashion that he never really succeeded in spelling out, this presence in the place of origin was going to work as a kind of catalytic engine to renew Judaism worldwide. He never thought in, that all Jews should move, even even after Hitler's ascendancy, that all that all Jews should end up in what became the state of Israel, he was looking for something more esoteric, something more more concerned with the renewal of language that he thought Zionism really needed to focus on. And in fact, I remember reading uh, in his diary when he was in his early 20s, he's, he, he writes at one point that the first thing people have to realize about Zionist doctrine is that it doesn't exist and that we have to create it. Mm-hmm. And he said, now, what, what should this doctrine consist of? And he, and, he, and, he, and he names the following things. A Zionist has to have a rigorous historical consciousness. There has to be a sense of solidarity with all humanity. There has to be misery over the conditions of Europe and a general state of spiritual anguish. That's it. Mm-hmm. Um, so he goes with he he goes to uh, Jerusalem in 1923 with this very high-minded, very abstract sense of the imperative of renewal and the prospect of doing so in the the holy city, and very quickly begins banging up against 
the reality at that point, not so much the necessity of forming a state, because it still wasn't clear that a state would emerge, but the mere fact that he's not living there only with Jews. Mm. Um, you know, he he had a very vague sense, of course, that there was another people in the land. But there's no real indication, at least in any of his uh, journal entries that I've seen or any of his letters, that this registered beyond the idea that there would be some semi-magical um, uh, face-to-face embrace with this other people of the Orient who were mm-hmm. already in the space of Palestine. He had a very romanticized idea, partly inspired by Martin Buber, who was a huge uh, influence on all of his peers, um, not just in Germany, throughout Central Europe. He delivered a number of lectures um, early in the 20th century about the idea of Judaism, what did it consist in, and in in one of these, he focused on the idea that the Jews, he said, are really Asiatic people. They're, they're, mm. they're places and in the West because they are not of the West. And in some intrinsic, in essentialist fashion, they are really one with the peoples of the Orient. So Buber implanted this idea, really in a generation of intellectuals, that they were only going to be able to come into their own, realize themselves, once they embraced their Oriental orientalized, in fact, self. And this this notion that there might be an, um, a really recalcitrant other population, mm-hmm. a population who did not, in fact, envision their future in the embrace of the Jew, yeah. doesn't seem to have been absorbed by Sholem until he, until he got there. And once he, once he did, by the mid-1920s, to his credit, he became part of this small but very influential movement called Brit Shalom. Martin Buber also uh, became a member without being in Palestine that wanted to uh, create a binational state. And he, Sholem fought very hard for this for a number of years until the mounting pressures at the end of the 1920s and, and then in the early 1930s with increased uh, issues in Eastern Europe of Jews being persecuted and emigrating in larger and larger numbers. And then, of course, after the Nazis took off and the immigration became that much greater, all of the more high-minded um, aspirations of what Zionism might might achieve without ever being a device to save Jews physically began to uh, began to fall away. And in my own story... While I didn't come with the obviously with the with the pressures that would eventually be placed on the state by something like what was happening in Europe in the in the late thirties and forties, I came similarly um, ill informed, fundamentally ignorant about the Palestinian um, the whole Palestinian cause and mm-hmm. and and while I would have always uh, supported, did support the idea that there should be a Palestinian state. That's an easy thing to say. You don't know what that means. One until can you're, just, you're there. of course, yeah. yes, they should have their own state. That mm-hmm. that seemed obvious, but it it wasn't clear to me what merely by living in the land within the Zionist uh, state, what that implied about my own political responsibilities. So I began because I lived there in. I, I really moved there at the start of the first intifada, almost exactly. Good and timing. It, yeah. <laughs> it was certainly a time that that, that that demanded that you confront the issues of why mm-hmm. an entire people uh, would really rise up in a, in a in a popular movement against their conditions. Um, you know, the, the, the second intifada is a is a more complicated subject for many reasons, but that first intifada was a genuinely uh, grassroots movement. And it was hard to accept, even early on, that there were that, as as more reactionary politicians suggested, that this was um, that this was a, a, a an orchestrated yeah. uh, uh, that it wasn't a grassroots that it wasn't a grassroots yeah, yeah. a real uprising. Yeah. How did you? Um, I mean, you, you chronicle somewhat your transformation, but it's also a transformation of your domestic life. Um, as you're building a family, as you're, you're scrambling for work, you and your wife at the time. Um, 
how did you really see yourself changing over that that period? Now that you can again look back at it from a quarter century on, thirty years on uh, from when you first got right. there. So. Well, um, it was a slow process of mm-hmm. of 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 a, a kind of bildung in its own right, a kind of political uh, political education um, that took place for me, and it was there were very specific events over the time that I was there, which I've for the most part, uh, tried to record in the book that were, that were pivot points that made me, that made me understand, uh, that one can't just idealistically up and move somewhere, uh, more or less as though it's, it's a tabula rasa, Mm -hmm. that, 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 that there are ways in which one's sheer, um, settlement within any culture has political implications. Unless it's a wasteland in Ireland. (laughs) But. <laughs> in, uh, I, w- even I wonder, there. even there, I think over time, but, uh, but it was, but, it, but at least there I was, uh, genuinely, um, so isolated yeah. that, it, that it's harder to see. Uh, um, but I guess, right. I guess that I understood for one, one thing that I came to understand is that even though I might've had essentially benevolent feelings towards the Palestinians, that isn't worth very much in it, in itself. And I began to see that just living my life in Jerusalem within a certain um, generally liberal community of friends wasn't doing anything to help. And when you're in this culture or you're in a culture where, like the culture in Israel, Palestine, where political issues are much more in your face, um, it's useful to recognize that it's only an illusion if you think your life is being lived without impacting Mm -hmm. those you live amongst who are not as fortunate as you either because they are politically disenfranchised in some way or because they're economically disenfranchised or sociologically in some other way. And and Israel is a is a very um, it's a very unpadded learning environment. Hmm. It's 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 very hard to have your eyes open, and and your ears uh, attentive, and not recognize that all of your actions are affecting other people. Now I was just starting a family. I had my wife was pregnant when we first moved there, and we had two other children over the years we were there. It's obviously hugely preoccupying to have a bunch of small kids running around, mm-hmm. and so it took a while for things to penetrate. Um, where we, it took a while for the place to penetrate, for us to become in some way pervious to our environment. But one thing about Jerusalem, uh, one of the reasons I've been attracted to to live there, is it's 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 so compact geographically that you can move between all these different worlds within the course of half a day. You can. I lived in. A, a neighborhood in that was in fact Sholem's old neighborhood, not consciously at the time, but Rahavia, which was known in his time as Little Berlin. There were so many mm-hmm. German immigrants there um, in the center of West Jerusalem. But you can walk to the center of East Jerusalem in, in no time at all, and you can then walk anywhere in the old city to the Christian quarter, to the Armenian yeah. quarter, to the Arab quarter, etc. So. Because I had been attracted to that as a writer, that's this unbelievable availability of all of these different worlds, I did have my eyes open. And while I might have initially been looking uh, at all of this history and all of this cultural diversity it, with some, um, I guess, eye, t- eye for the taste and eye for the exoticism of it, uh, you, you you can't you can't you can't try to pay attention for too long without understanding the conditions yeah the quotidian aspects the of it the quotidian what aspects it of what these people are, are going through I, I will say my last trip um was 1984 for my my bar mitzvah um the great thing was that we we had to combine with another kid uh having his bar mitzvah so we could get a minion together at, at the wall um he turned out to be from Glen Rock New Jersey about 8 miles from where i live uh, just by sheer coincidence it was you know too kids from New Jersey standing there at the wall with a bunch of their Israeli relatives. And, and yeah. Um, so you do find all kinds mm-hmm. in a, you know, pretty concentrated area like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing, how long did the book take 
for you? Well, um, that's a good question. <laughs> um, you know, I, it was tr- only three years ago that we spoke, and, and yeah, you know, I had um, I had already when when we spoke last begun um, spending more time going back and forth to uh, to Jerusalem, thinking about the city and thinking about my own uh, response to it. In some way, thinking about my own um, addiction to Jerusalem, mm-hmm. despite all of the uh, political, ideological theological vexedness of the place. And part of why I was going back and speaking with so many different people, initially people in often in different political capacities, um, also different cultural insti- heads of different mm-hmm. cultural institutions. Part of my reason was to under- try to understand what that addiction really consisted in. So there was this, this book had a long, um, a long period of, I don't know, maybe just incubation. Just oh, incubation is good yeah, too. For yeah. you. Um, but the writing of it was, was relatively quick because mm. in fact, to somewhat to my horror, <laughs> in fact, when I, when I, when I started the process of writing the book, I found uh, a, a journal that I'd kept the first year I was in Jerusalem. And at that point I noted down every book I was reading and I've been doing that since 1989, so that's that's fine. But go on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I was only one year ahead of you in this case. This is this is from '88, and um, do you have a lot was, of them you're embarrassed about when when you look back? I, I, you know, I'm embarrassed <laughs> that I am still reading exactly the same books. Oh, okay, I, I have ones that I'm. Oh my God, I was reading that. But yeah, okay. So I'm, I'm glad you were more advanced than I was. <laughs> well, I mean, in a sense, but the but it shows that I've I I have not escaped these texts. I was, I was reading Benjamin's essays and Benjamin and Sholem letters and Sholem's greatest hits and many books in the, in the orbit of those, of those two thinkers. So I clearly have never succeeded in, in, in resolving whatever it is that I find both, um, provocative and in, in, in some way a, a source of solace in these texts. I reread most of most of uh, the works of of Benjamin and, and Sholem for this, but still they're they're really part of part of me at this point. It's an interesting aspect of the book, the relationship between the two of them. In a terrible shorthand, they come off <clears throat> early on like a couple of undergrads who are you know coming up with with their big you know we're going to revolutionize the world thing, because of course that's the that model didn't really exist you know at that point. So I'm not, I'm not being too derogatory towards them. Although I used to hold uh, Benjamin in some disdain for not quite, uh, for being such a great cultural critic and not quite figuring out it was time to leave uh, when he, when he should have left. But your book helped me get over that uh, in, in a lot of respects, or at least humanize him uh, a bunch. But the relationship between them, the, the, um, we'll say the gestalt or the alchemy, uh, but between them, the way they both fed off each other, not in a, a straightforward uh, way. Do you see those as complementary aspects of your own persona, or do you feel that there is a a you know another George that you're <laughs> you know bouncing off of back and forth and and uh, developing ideas with? That, that's that's a tricky one. Um, uh, you know, they were both uh, magisterial scholars in their own way, and I'm not. Um, psychologically. I will say that Benjamin is closer to Zweig, closer in his um, in his in his failures uh, uh, <laughs> in the failure of his life. I feel more easily uh, an identification with him. Mm-hmm. Sholem 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 was a fighter and a real survivor, and that's one of the reasons that he was very interesting to pick up as an, as a as a as a subject of. Uh, contemplation and, and and as a biographical subject after Zweig, who's who didn't know how to live, arguably. Um, but I can't, I can't really. Uh, it's not, it's not me. I'm, I'm, I'm although I'm you not, did follow Sholem. I mean, you I followed, followed his path Sholem, more directly right. than you did yeah. the other two. Well, he, he, that's true. And 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 I think that I took from him. Um, I took certainly from him the 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 idea that. The Jewish tradition uh, was capacious of its own, so capacious that it could embrace its own subversion. I mean, that's that's one one aspect of what Sholem 
shows us in the Kabbalah is that the Kabbalah itself is an explosive series of texts, one that is challenging pieties, challenging not just pieties, theological pieties, but pieties about Jewish identity. Mm-hmm. And yeah, Can you expand on that a little bit in terms of yeah. what Sholem really reveals? Right. Well, first of all, it's, it's important to recognize that the, the Kabbalah can't be summed up because it's many different mystical traditions, some of them within that operate within a relatively direct intellectual lineage of one rabbi teaching a disciple who teaches another disciple, but ma- within many different centers um, that it began really formally began in southern France and in Spain, um, also in Italy eventually. Um, but there were lots of different people writing and thinking, and all of them were using commentary on the canonical texts of Jewish tradition as a way to expand the possibility of those texts, but not always in the same way. Sholem created a very synthetic narrative of what the Kabbalah was all about, but at the core of it, I I, I believe, um, what he added to the interpretive uh, strategies in looking at these texts was the notion that the Kabbalah is really a meditation on Jewish history itself, that it isn't just an intra-theological discussion between rabbis over time, but it's a very, very um, historically aware and historically subversive effort to struggle in particular with the Jewish, with the exile uh, post the the exile from Spain in 1492, um, as as the real uh, axial axial point of um, removal from Europe, as the trigger to begin thinking about if Jews suffered this extraordinary fate, how does redemption work against that? And Sholem's interpretation of Kabbalah confers on the individual um, an enormous responsibility and capacity to participate in the healing of of the universe, really, not just the individual's own self and soul, but the pro- the project of tiku- what's called tikkun olam, repairing the world, is a, 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 a cosmic endeavor that each Jew is tasked to contribute to through prayer and through intention in ritual and through reading and ways of living that attempt to embody principles of um not it's not it's not an imitation of any of any divine figure but principles of intense ethical and also more mysterial mythologically informed responsibilities mm. But he was never, at least within the the framework of the book, he wasn't a devout Jew. No, he tried An to... An observant be, Jew, we'll, we'll say. He yeah. tried to become one. Uh, very well, we all briefly. try at different times, but yeah. <laughs> it's, it, no, that's correct. In, yeah. in 1915, so he's, he, in fact, when he was only 17, he had a brief period of joining um, the Orthodox uh, Party in Berlin, but it was the same time when he also joined the Socialist party partly under the influence of his older brother Werner and he was more committed to uh, anarchist anarchism socialism socialist anarchism um, really than he was to the ritual but you know I, I I think it's very important again going going back to that idea of, of history and the subversion mm-hmm. of tradition to think about Sholem as um, Sholem's own fascination with dialectical processes and his own conviction that he was leading, or intellectually able to help lead, at least, a very important revolt against the, tr- the tradition of Jewish historiography that had been dominant at, in, in the last generation, in, in, the, in the late 19th century. And what troubled him was the, uh, the development and the dominance of schools of essentially rationalist Judaism, there were, there was, there were very specific um, 
groups of Jewish scholars, uh, philosophers and historians who, at least in Sholem's eyes, and this has been challenged also by some more recent scholars, but in Sholem's eyes, were so bent on finding and singling out and highlighting those aspects of Jewish tradition which were most universal, most easily uh, integrated with all the other religions of the world mm. in their most benign, anodyne form, that they really stripped the religion of all of its force and, by extension, stripped the people of any vitality. I came to think of very much of... Uh, Sholem's project in relationship to Freud's project. Sholem himself spoke gen- generally very, um, if not disdainfully, indifferently about Freud. But at the same time, he once called himself an, archaeolog- an archaeologist of the Jewish people's spiritual past. And I'm sure that he was thinking of that metaphor of archaeology in ways that chime with Freud's invocation of the metaphor about going into the unconscious. And Sholem saw the Kabbalah, as the unconscious, the underworld, the hidden subterranean layer of Judaism that was dangerous, sometimes demonic, uh, sometimes also angelic, filled with all sorts of disturbing ideas, but ideas that that shook up and potentially animated, energized, gave a new source of vitality to a religion and a people who, again, to go back to what you had initially raised about his, the question you'd re- initially raised about his his presence in Berlin, whom he saw as moribund, really in a twilight, in a twilight phase. So he, he saw Kabbalah itself as, or as, as a vehicle through which to help give the Jewish people a new lease on intellectual, spiritual vitality. And it's it's very important in that way that he wasn't just making, he had no interest in making an entry in some archive with his works. He wanted them, he wanted them to play a role in the evolving consciousness of Jewish, uh, the evolving consciousness or uh, enterprise of, of mm-hmm. Jewish modernity. And it's why, in fact, he strongly implies in more than one place that Zionism may be the heir to the project that the Kabbalists were involved in. It's a, it's a complex idea. Um, maybe we can... Yeah, one, on. one that uses the state as a... Uh, the founding of the state as a... a if not the founding of the state, the... the or just the... Settlement the, of the, uh, yeah. the, 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 the... The migration mm-hmm. and the effort to be to create some form of autonomous existence. Mm-hmm. How successful do you think he was? I mean my, my Chabad pals are are you know holding Kabbalah scholarship uh, I mean, they, I'm on the email list for them. So they, do they ever they, talk about Sholem though? I, I've never gone to any of them because you know um, God forbid I show up any time but the high holidays. And I know Rabbi Zvi is probably listening to this one but you know <laughs> I'm sure he'll let me go on this. But <laughs> Well you know Sholem had a very um, was his Kabbalah, um, you know, frowned on by other other branches of Kabbalah scholarship? I guess he didn't have. I, I think it's fair to say that he didn't have other uh, friends, allies in, mm-hmm. in the world of Kabbalah. Almost full stop. Um, you, you know, it has to be it has to be borne in mind there wasn't really Kabbalah scholarship before him. I mean, mm-hmm. that really is his signal achievement is he created an academic discipline. I mean, how often does that happen in history? It's, it's unheard of. Mm -hmm. Um, so there were very scholarly rabbis who, who, who worked within different traditions, but they were working within traditions of practice, communities of belief. And one of the obstacles that Sholem encountered and eventually confessed to when he got to Jerusalem was that although there were still Kabbalists in the city, and in fact, as, uh, recent scholarship has shown a number of yeshivas that were really primarily dedicated to uh, developing Kabbalistic theses and and practicing Kabbalah. He didn't he 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 didn't gain admission, integrate into that world because he was uh, because he was un, um, non halakhic because he didn't observe Jewish law because he wasn't. Yeah. He wasn't orthodox, he, and he wasn't speaking the same language. He was trying, to some extent at least, to look at this material with, a, with an historically critical eye. And that's, that's not the nature of Kabbalah scholarship 
however erudite you might be, if you're taking this as words that demand certain practices, certain 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 articles of faith. And in fact, um, this is this is this is a crucial point because Sholem began describing himself as a religious anarchist after he had become less uh, involved in political anarchism. He, he, he began using this phrase and, in fact, continued to use it, to the best of my knowledge, up until the end of his life. And he had a very specific uh, explanation for why he called himself a religious anarchist. And, in fact, he made the claim that everyone was more or less a religious anarchist after a certain point in history, uh, I, I think incorrectly. But um, he said that if, if you don't accept the literal revelation of Torah on, from, on, from Moses on Sinai, you don't accept that authority. Already you're operating in a completely other sphere of religious thought. Right. Um, what is your authority then? Where, where, does, where does it come from? I mean, it's an, it's an, it's an anarchist structure. And his argument about the, the Kabbalists themselves, who he really considered to be Kabbalists, and, and it's a relatively... Um, uh, narrow time period, although Jewish mysticism itself could be traced back to the Bible itself, he was focused on um, what happened from primarily, really, between the 13th century and the 17th century. There are important exceptions, and Hasidism comes in in a way that that confuses uh, the story for Sholem because he was not such a fan of Hasidism, but it's yeah. not it's not that long in terms of Jewish history, and the Kabbalists that he's focused on were all people who were absolutely devout Orthodox Jews, and he he never ceases to I- insist on this point that however heretical their teachings might have been, that they could get away with these kinds of heresies because they were f- pious pious Jews participating in all the rituals that was that were demanded of any other uh, Orthodox Jew. It's funny because it reminds me of, uh, and something else in the book reminds me of this too, Leo Strauss's esoteric writing concept where, again, we're saying one thing, but the the true adepts understand what I'm saying underneath it all, which Sholem himself uh, says apparently near the end that, you know, the, the real Gershom is is hidden in little like pale fire. It's hidden in little notes uh, mm-hmm. throughout his his own texts. That you know, again, somebody smart can can perceive them. Bullshit or not? Well, I mean, I'm also I, I'm also he he said that, and he was also very laudatory about a description of him that was given by um, one of his students. In fact, I think it's the only one that he really endorsed. Who who compared Sholem's presence in his texts to the way a medieval painter might hide himself within a larger canvas that's mm-hmm. depicting some grand pageant or something. He liked that, and, and as yeah. you say, he, I, there's a specific quote where he describes himself being dispersed across all his writings. I think it's, I think it's absolutely true. I mean, uh, there, there, there is a remark from his um, wife, Fania, after Sholem had died, it, who, who, that, that really stuck with me, when she said that everything that... Sholem did in Jerusalem was was a search for himself, and I think that's correct. He's what gives his what gives his writing its potency, its kick, is that even when the scholarship is arcane and the texts are are um, dealing with theological concepts that feel very abstruse to us today, there there's something driving him that is very feels very very immediate. Mm-hmm. He's, this is not just dry paper to him at in ever, and it, what, it's what makes his it's what makes his reading of these texts alive, and what makes his effort to find in these texts some direction for uh, the future of the Jewish tradition at the hour of real crisis created by the Holocaust so powerful. And I think going back to my own um, engagement with the works, it. It's the it's it it's always for me comes back to the reality that Sholem was confronting the possibility of Judaism Jewishness becoming effectively extinct mm-hmm. and trying to think his way out of a, a an abyss that that big and that dark 
through the channel of the Kabbalah that made these books resonate for me as powerfully as they did because we can define the um, erosion of of Judaism as as a as a force in the world in different ways. Whether someone points to literal assimilation, which wouldn't be as much the issue for me, or a complete estrangement from the core texts. Yeah. But if we lose all knowledge, regardless of our ritual uh, commitment, if we lose the knowledge as well, the question becomes what what is it that keeps any flicker of the flame alive? And and this point of text was crucial for Sholem. I mean, he he was hugely critical when he was an, a, a young Zionist in Berlin of his fellow young Zionists, specifically because they didn't know Hebrew, or many of them didn't, few of them did. And if they knew Hebrew, they didn't really know the core text right. of, of the Jewish canon. And so much of Sholem's the, the the freedom of his brush in his cosmic speculations, which can be extraordinary, uh, so extravagant. But he knew that he had the basic representational chops. You know that a painter, a figurative painter, who who right. who knows technically exactly what he's doing, can then make an amazing work of abstract art because there is a spine of knowledge, even if it doesn't find uh, an objectified. Uh, realization on, on, on the canvas of what they're about. And, and Sholem had that incredible grounding um, in, in the canon and felt that it was crucial for Jewish identity that that not be allowed to disappear. Yeah, it was one of those questions I had with um, <clears throat> Dan Goldhagen when I was, I was recording with him, where he put me in mind of the thought experiment of, you know, Gil, it doesn't matter how devout you or I are, we're Jews to the, to the Gentiles. You know, there's a degree of, you know, we'll always be defined by, by somebody else's perception of what Jews are. So, you know, it doesn't behoove us to become observant for that reason, but it does behoove us to, to understand what it means to be a Jew uh, in a much more practical sense than the, again, tikkun olam, mystical redemption. I, I want to just intervene on that really quickly, that mm-hmm. this that idea is exactly what Shola most objected to, is the idea of being defined by someone else. Yeah. You know, for him... The issue with, I'm not saying it's a soul way, no, no, but, no, but it is, no, no, no. you know, regardless of what we do, that, we'll always that, be that Jews to somebody is, else. Yeah, Sure, yeah. and yeah. and that's that's an issue with all sorts of political uh, implications. Yeah. But but Sholem, Sholem felt that the reason anti-Semitism mattered in the Germany that he knew, in the, the Germany in the early 20s, in the, in the Weimar period, was not because he felt a threat of imminent physical assault in any form, but because there was a refusal to accept Jewish identity on its own terms, that you know that the, the Jew could could only find his or her way within the society by absolutely uh, attempting to merge and to e- erase all yeah. integral values. Um, so what he was, so much of what he was trying to do was to say, well, what would it be to look at Jewish history? and say it as as a self propelled project and this was something that he was explicitly trying to do in major trends in jewish mysticism and something interestingly that hannah arant picked up in a review that um that she wrote and wrote very very enthusiastically about the work saying that you know sholem had managed to turn the jew into a protagonist in the world history, as opposed to simply a, a victim, uh, someone yeah. acted upon. It was the agency that the Kabbalah accorded because of this ability of the devout Jew practicing Jewish mysticism to influence massive events historically and even beyond, even beyond imminent history within transcendent history that, that made the Kabbalah important as a political lesson. Yeah, how do you see the our mystic tradition interweaving with Christian Muslim and other other forms of mysticism. I know there's a, a Gnostic thread that comes up uh, dur- during the book, but do you see Sholem kind of approaching those other faiths versions of this, or or looking at what the overlaps are in terms of of what how those mysticisms inform those religions' understandings of the world? One of the places where Sholem um, does, I think, it tangled up interpretively is, is exactly there. He was, he was 
he was driven to show that Jewish mysticism was an intra-Jewish phenomenon. And he, mm-hmm. he, he wrote on this repeatedly in, in different essays on trying to show the way these, these branches of the tradition evolved through specifically Jewish tenets of faith. But it's, it's a broken branch from the beginning. Um, and it, I can give you a few different examples. First of all, um, Sholem's whole notion of the Kabbalah as a, as, as, a, as a symbolic system of thought, which is central to how he looked at the Kabbalah. Everything has a meaning behind the meaning. The mm-hmm. words have meaning behind the meaning. The objects have meaning behind the experience has meaning behind the meaning. Things, things symbolize a greater truth. That whole system, arguably, and the scholar um, of the scholar Moshe Adel, who's the most important revisionist historian of, of um, Sholem, has, has made this point very persuasively, that Sholem takes a great deal of his thinking about Jewish mysticism's um, symbolic nature from a 15th century thinker named Johann Reuchlin. Now, Reuchlin explicitly took much of his thinking about symbolic reality from Pythagoras. In fact, Reuchlin said, I am the reincarnation of Pythagoras. Sholem at one point said, if I believed in transmigration, I would be the reincarnation of Reuchlin. So we do have that within Kabbalah. We, we have re- uh, reincarnation you know. is a central notion, yeah. but the idea that these figures might not even be Jewish, mm-hmm. who you are being reincarnated from, certainly casts into doubt the idea that this is an entirely uh, Jewish strand of thought. There was another very important thinker, Franz Molitor, a 19th century uh, Christian yeah. mystic who helped to uh, in, in, informed and. Il- and expanded Sholem's sense of Kabbalah's possibilities. And then, going back to Walter Benjamin, when Sholem was in the process of of really, I think, um, charting his understanding of how the language mysticism of Kabbalah worked, he was in very intense conversation with Walter Benjamin during those years. Their, Their friendship continued until Benjamin's suicide in 1940, but was particularly intense. They, they met in 1915. It was particularly intense um, I- until Sholem left Berlin, although they had an amazing epistolary relationship also. But when they were young men, they were talking about what language was, how it could be abused politically, what it, what it meant for language to be uh, a means to an end in a political sense, and how true language in some way was a thing unto itself in, in Sholem's Kabbalistic terms, an actual instrument of the divine's creation. The ideas they traded back and forth had as much to do with Benjamin's knowledge of French and German symbolist poetry and different strands of German romantic philosophy. There's a lot of Nietzsche mi- mi- mixed in with Sholem's thought, um, as they did with, uh, with something specific to the Kabbalah itself. So, there, there is, there is some contradiction at work here. Sholem's Kabbalah, interpretively, is a very syncretic, I think, syncretically rich doctrine, but it's not something that he, that he, I think, ever effectively acknowledges. It, tr- it, 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 it messed something up for him. He had to believe, and and this is sort of, I, I feel like it's the Achilles' heel in his thought is this essentialist. Craving for an essential, like I say, a denial of of true influences. In he, you know, he he'll mention them casually, the yeah. names. I mean, and to say that Reuchlin, he would, yeah. could be his antecedent, literally as a soul, is a remarkable. But almost defining it as if it's part of my series of thought, then it must actually be Jewish, Jewish Kabbalah. Yeah, that, yeah. that's what okay. he does in a, in a sort of remarkable way. I mean, he a reverse assimilationist. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's well put. You know, at one point, he even. I mean, I remember at one point in his journals. He, he he starts calling Holderlein, you know, a great Zionist, a Jew, um, because he's thinking in ways that resonate for him with whatever the essence yeah. of Jewish identity is. So he he a bit grotesquely, arguably, mm. uh, tries to uh, do this reverse assimilation of thinkers who matter to him and to uh, deny the the ways that the thought is 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 braided mm-hmm. across different traditions. It, there, there are key differences with Christian 
mysticism and obviously with I- Islamic mysticism, um, although some of the Sufi, uh, Sufi mystical strands have at least been informed by contact as well sure. with Jewish mystics. But um, you know, Jewish mysticism, the particular structure of Kabbalah, at least that, that Sholem focused on, it's a very... Um, it, the the architecture of it is 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 very specific to a reinterpretation of genesis and in fact a pre genesis intra divine reality and I think that moment of creation uh, that 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 Sholem focuses focuses on in different ways um, is 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 in fact pretty specific to, to Jewish thought. There's a very strange uh, idea of something called Adam Kadmon, the sort of primordial, it's not a man really, but it's an anthropomorphic giant figure who exists before, long before um, humanity is created, who is involved with the deliverance of a divine light into these specially fashioned vessels that are to contain the divine light and at the moment of creation or the moment the penultimate moment before creation the force of these divine rays shatters these vessels and these holy sparks are then scattered across creation and the purpose of individual Jewish um, prayer and ritual and, and thought for the practicing Kabbalists was concerned with regathering these scattered sparks. And in some way, when that fire of the divine had all been re reunified, uh, redemption would follow. And it was great. I mean, I discovered, uh, well, a book just called Kabbalah by, by Sholem back in early nineties, I guess, in a used bookstore. Um, and as an aspiring, uh, um, we'll say an aspiring writer. Uh, uh, it, it gave me a good deal of um, mythopoetic fictional fodder. Uh, the 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 whole kelepot, uh, the the, um, the the shattered vessels, the the husks that were left behind, etc. Um, so it was, I would say, ammunition in a sense. It, it was good material like that, but the idea well, that it was actually, you know. I think mythopoetic is a good word, Sholem. One of the points that he makes about the Kabbalah is that it is a reinjection of mythological thought into the Jewish tradition. It had been exorcised uh, in in the process of creating Jewish law, at least to a huge extent. Um, and the Zohar, which is considered the closest thing to a Bible within Jewish mystical tradition, Sholem once called a great detective novel. Mm-hmm. Um, why would he do that? I mean, it has lots of different characters. It has lots of you're trying to solve questions of evil, good and evil. Yeah. Um, and and that's that's another important. Um, and I guess that's the the big question. I mean, is um, does it create a knowable universe as opposed to a God moves in mysterious ways? That even if we can't find the key, there's a key. It's sort of like Ron Rosenbaum's uh, uh, take on uh, uh, Charles Portis, the the novelist. That there's always a lockbox with the, the, the answer somewhere, if we could just figure out where the key is, we'd, we'd be all set. Or actually, um, your wife's work on Middlemarch uh, reminds me of, of Casabon, the, the one who's always working on the key to all mythologies, but it turns out he wasn't actually able to put anything together. Um, not to give a spoiler alert about Middlemarch, but, you know. <laughs> right. Well, keys are certainly uh, a central idea. And in fact, I have an epigraph from a, a, a quote that um, Sholem cites uh, in one essay from the the um, philosopher Origen who who talked about the um, the divine palace being a, a, a vast a vast space with many many different doors and before each door there's a key but it's not the right one now further uh, gnarling that idea is the fact that it seems that this attribution to a Hebrew scholar that Origen uh, makes is itself spurious. And I believe that Sholem probably knew this because he was such an incredible philologist and would have understood that the language didn't fit. And he still chooses to highlight this mm-hmm. and chooses to highlight it 
in a discussion where he's also talking about Franz Kafka, who he wants to claim as part of the Kabbalistic tradition in some fashion. Mm -hmm. And this gets again at that idea that what Sholem is involved in is a much more complex syncretic project. But I think I like that idea of the keys, uh, the keys before each door, but not the right key. It's a bit of a Marx Brothers image. And, and it, 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 it may get at whatever it is that the Kabbalah offers, which is not any knowable ultimate solution to all these great mysteries but it gives you lots and lots of different different keyholes to look through and different keys to try and different doors and lots of different ways at coming at the great questions of the universe. One of the accusations that Shola makes against the preceding generation of historiographers and indeed theologians is that they had elevated the whole project of Judaism to such an extent that it no longer really had textured, te- tactile contact with the real questions of good and evil that people wrestle with in everyday life. They had removed it into this ap- empyrean where it was no longer um, it was no longer urgently germane. And the Kabbalah puts the problem of evil front and center and says it's real, it's evil is not an absence of the good. There is a very complex um, uh, m- map of the divine's own attributes in which evil has a place. Um, Basically what the Kabbalah suggests is that although it continues to um, be founded on a monotheological idea, God emerges through a series, in in a series of stages of attributional constellations called Sephiroth, and these are all very exquisitely, very precisely balanced and calibrated to keep different attributes of, say, in the simplest way in relationship to evil, the quality of compassion is needs to be closely balanced. Judgment needs to be closely balanced with compassion. And evil kind of juts through the fabric of the divine's emergence in the material world when these attributes get out of whack, when something gets imbalanced and evil exists in a Kabbalistic sense in our world when the quality of stern judgment isn't properly um, counterweight by by mercy, by love, I guess, to some extent, certainly by compassion. So why those imbalances occur is is another question. But it's a real thing, and humanity's responsibility for those imbalances wavers in the Kabbalah. Sometimes these problems seem to have been inscribed on the universe before humanity was created. Others are related to some kind of notion of original sin, which is not, as in the Christian tradition, exactly or at least exclusively a sexual sin, but is is a much more multidimensional event of failing on the part of humanity in the world. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure how we got there. <laughs> we got there by talking about Gershom Shalom. That, that's really, yeah. yeah. You, you know, you talked about how do how do I think I changed over the years I was in Israel? And in a way, what I really want to respond to that question is, is it isn't so much how I changed when I was there, because I feel I was to some extent in a cloud mm-hmm. while I was there. But in the by since? having left it, having left my life there so completely, I had this amazing opportunity to kind of re, to peel back different corners of my life that existed in this very discrete uh, geographical temporal space and get a kind of bird's eye view on everything that I didn't see. So there was a double motivation um, in, in that personal, in that, in that personal strata of the book. I both wanted to show where innocence and complicity where the line between them gets blurry, which I think was the case in our own life. And I also wanted to offer something like exploded view scholarship on my own, uh, why Sholem matters. You know, uh, Sholem is not a figure who too many people have heard of uh, today, um, although he is central for those interested in a in a certain tradition of Jewish, not even Jewish German, but Jewish uh, 
um, humanist thought. Mm. He's he's a he's a largely um, well he's he's largely disappeared outside of the academy. So to make him matter, I had to show why he matters so much to me. And this is very it is a very personal book, and the story of the family that exists within it. I believe is really a political portrait of a marriage. You know, it, it's very intimate, but it's it's trying to look at how a family and all that the creation of a family entails is also part of a, a, a national project, mm-hmm. right? And this is Milton's point, right, in his in his treatises on divorce, when he talks about why divorce should be allowed, because for the health of the of of the of the civic entity, of, of for the health of the state, people have to be able to uh, part if they can no longer have a meet conversation. Um, so he understood and have, and made, in fact, his definition of marriage and by extension of divorce, partly a political argument. What that has to do with the community, and I think that. Our marriage uh, fell apart in very, uh, very overtly and unusually political ways. Um, it wasn't really ever a, a, a loss of, you know, love and affection and care. Certainly for the children, it wasn't that. But we, we somehow um, absorbed into ourselves something of the political intensity and the political questioning that Israel can tells many people to magnify in their consciousness and how this played out with us ended up uh, driving us apart, at least in terms of our domestic um, existence as a, as a, as a, as a whole family. Hmm. And the response to the book so far? People say extraordinary, extraordinarily wonderful things to me. The the people who, um, particularly people who have thought about some of these, these questions of Israel today and of, why Jewish mysticism may still be a living uh, agent in in the tradition. Um, people have seemed very moved, and I've been uh, very grateful for that. Uh, people, some people have object, objected to the politics um, because I do feel that the state of Israel in its current iteration isn't sustainable, and that it needs to. Um, Try something more radical in in terms of embracing and. You seem very supportive of the Oslo period. I was certainly very yeah. supportive when I was there. Um, I don't think that can be. We can return to that, no. and I think that that that's um, that's a whole other set. Yeah, of questions. and and yeah, you don't point fingers as to why it doesn't work, but you just you, the way you show it, and it's part of your life there that it was a pivotal moment um, that we. That we, fell apart, and yeah. one amazing thing is is really to have witnessed how the death of a single person, the assassination of Rabin, really can throw history completely uh, off course. Which I guess is another another parallel with Sholem. I mean, he's he's there when World War One is starting. Not there, there, but you know, you're he's part world of World War II. Right? Not so World War One. I, I mean, you get uh, Ferdinand being killed, oh, and all in, of a sudden, in, in Europe, there, yeah, the yes, world is right. is changing around him. And, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's an important point in one way in which I, I do hope that the book will resonate for people is that both um, both Sholem and Benjamin's lives were lives lived in resistance always. I mean, Sholem when he's in. Berlin as a young man is fighting against his own family's hyper bourgeois existence. He's fighting against German nationalism. He's fighting against the militarism. He was that, that led to the to the First World War, and then of course, uh, what happened in the Weimar years. He was a he was a he was a very very staunch pacifist, along with being a socialist and anarchist. He fights all those battles. Benjamin fights them as well in a very different way. And I think I think it's worth actually spending a second on um we, we different... haven't talked enough about the two of them uh, and how they contrast but yeah. yeah yeah um well one way they contrast is in what uh, in what fighting meant i think mm. um you know benjamin uh it, that's fine okay <laughs> no we're, we're in new york <laughs> yesterday i was recording in upstate new york and it's completely quiet and then the guy's air conditioning turned on so <laughs> you know there's this, always this that. actually we don't usually get anymore there oh, okay. um um 
let me actually finish the one yeah, the sorry. one thought. So so but then when um when Sholem gets to Palestine in twenty three, he's immediately fighting the reactionary trends in in the Jewish settlement project and he continues to advocate for um a, a Zionism that will acknowledge the rights and existence of the, the Palestinian people. And in fact, after the 67 war, he's part of the first group of signatories of this politi- political public letter that was issued from Hebrew University saying that the territories had to be immediately returned. Um, he, he fought his whole life. And thinking about this moment in time, one realizes, you know, some... These these battles don't necessarily end in four years. Uh, right. You know, he Sholem Sholem really there were there were brief periods that that there was some kind of respite, but uh, but not long. And of course, after the Second World War, he was uh, then fighting to try to bring some kind of acceptance to the Jewish state project, and got in was was given um, a very uh, important and ultimately to him heartbreaking task of going around Europe trying to salvage libraries of books uh, that from communities that had been killed yeah. or otherwise um, dispersed. And uh, a story that I heard is that the trip was so upsetting, the scale of loss, of course, of life be- before libraries, but of libraries as well as lives, was so um, so profoundly shocking that when he came back, he was effectively paralyzed for a year. Um, but Benjamin took a, took a quieter, but I think no less valid form of resistance if we think about paths before us now. And I'll, I'll give you just one example. Um, after Hitler's appointment as chancellor in the, in the mid-1930s, he wrote this, this essay that I believe he was able to get published in Germany at the time, which was called simply German Men of Letters. Eventually it was expanded German Men and Women of Letters. And it's a very strange document. It consists of these extremely domestic communications between some of the most renowned figures of German thought, of German romantic thought, German poetry, etc., and his epigraph at the beginning of uh, at the beginning of this document is a key to come back to that word of, of what he was doing. He says, "Honor without fame, greatness without glory, dignity without pay." What it's possible to glean from correspondence that he had about these letters and from scholarship about what they consist in is that he was trying to humanize these illustrious great heroes who would have been claimed within the pantheon of Aryan warrior mm-hmm. um, Teutonic uh, giants by dissolving, in his own words, the distinction between the individual and the author in a, a, a kind of sea of absolute humanness. Mm. He was trying to remove the vacuous veneration that leads to a deification of the human over the, 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 the collective network of lived human experience in which love and, and the search for beauty are sources of meaning, not of denigration of another people who don't fit you racially, ideologically, right. etc. So it was in its own way a very political document, although it reads in an incredibly mundane way as a, as a beautiful, very lyrical, uh, very personal exchange hmm. between all of these figures who one thinks of in a, in a very illustrious context. And I think within the book you do that, um, that contrast of the domestic life and the public Personae of of Benjamin and and Cholam especially. You, again, we have the um, the essays and the the works they produce, and then uh, you start to reproduce the um, married life and and Sholem's, you know wandering in as the third wheel in uh, um, Benjamin's 
marriage at one point and uh, the various ways things go off the rails. Um, well, thank you for noticing that because it was important. Well, it's hysterical. It's one of the funniest parts of the book. But <laughs> yeah. It is important to me also with these figures to show them as 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 as, as human beings, not just as thinkers. I mean, Benjamin mm-hmm. and Sholem were uh, minds of such magnitude and were so precocious as well. But they also struggled to... I mean, you help make Benjamin... Like I said, you re, you redeem him somewhat in, for me in terms of why he didn't leave. And you you get past the... We have the historical hindsight where we can say, well, obviously the Nazis were going to take over and destroy everything. Why wouldn't someone go? When you're in the middle of it and you have the entire weight of a life on top of you, it's not as easy a decision. We're not as, uh, you know, we don't have as much foresight as Weig did or as, as Sholem. Uh, Sholem's reasons for leaving weren't, you know, oh my God, the Jews are going to get annihilated no. so much as we need to, to, no, in a fact, it, mission. Yeah. at one point he says after, after the war, he said, you know, as far as the camps, none of us thought of that, he yeah. said. So he, he was not anticipating a genocide. That was really not his reasoning at all in going to Palestine. And you're right, Benjamin, the weight of everyday life and like Zweig, the lack of a destination also. Yeah. He flirted over and over with the prospect that Sholem tried to entice him with of, of going to Jerusalem. He he could have gone to New York with Horkheimer's uh, Institute, presumably. Um, but he couldn't think his way out of his also his love for France yeah. um, and his identification of himself as part of the fabric of what Europe... European thought was and European yeah. identity. And it's one thing for my father as an eight-year-old refugee to end up in, in Palestine in 1946 and have to help you know build a country and be a, a you know, we'll say a, a pioneer, basically. It's another thing for very cultured European Jews to, no, no, I'm going to give up everything and, and go to a desert and, you know, which again, you, you bring up at certain point the massive influx of, of merchants and, you know, shop owners uh, showing up when they don't need shop owners in Palestine. They needed guys who were going to, you know, trailblaze right. and, and build this, the country. And this, of course, horrified Cholin because it seemed to him a replication of those aspects of bourgeois Berlinese life and, bourgeois yeah. life that he had <laughs> fled from. What would you ask Sholem? One question, you know, if you had the opportunity. Well, I think I, think I would ask him about where uh, a question that... that has to do with where the book ends up. Um, I had, I, I, I found um, myself increasingly struck by the number of times that in his later essays and in interviews, Sholem makes mention of Walt Whitman mm-hmm. and of the idea that Walt Whitman was doing with a certain kind of secular n- nature um, poetry and philosophical speculation, something very similar to what the Kabbalists were doing. And it's an intriguing idea for lots of reasons. Um, One which seems to open up the possibility of what the Kabbalah was about. I had an extraordinary experience with Harold Bloom, who um, I, I visited while writing the book, and... Bloom knew Sholem quite well. Um, We didn't have a lot of time together uh, when I saw him, but without me asking for him to do so, almost immediately he brought out a chart that he was working on, that he had worked on, created with Gershom Sholem, that compared specific Kabbalistic notions with specific mystical ideas from Whitman. There was some effort at constellating these notions that was very serious and very provocative. I came to feel that for many uh, political reasons and also reasons having to do with that strand of semi-syncretic mystical thought that there, the prospect of using ecological activity that works with the literal common ground between the Palestinians and the Jews might offer a way forward 
not immediately politically, but in terms of a collaborative activity that could benefit both peoples. And there are little indications of this happening. There is a movement called uh, Birds Without Boundaries, Birds Without Borders, that's been around for a while, that operates in Jordan, I believe still in Egypt, Lebanon, where um, after experiences of intense uh, land contamination through pesticides beginning in Israel, which ran off, of course, over the borders, there was an understanding that something had to be done less poisonous, and barn owls are an incredibly effective um, consumer of rodents. They consume thousands, each one. And a project began a building nest for these uh, barn owls on both sides of the borders. Um, there also have been very simple projects cataloging flowers together, species of wildflowers, that I think creates certain kinds of dialogue that manage, at least in the moment of engagement with this very environmentally fraught region, this area that's uh, so, fragile. so yeah. dry also, and the droughts get worse for lots of reasons, not just climate change, but also agriculture in, in, uh, in, in, on the Nile that removes um, some of the condensation uh, that used to be part of a mushroom cloud that would go up over southern Israel and add to the rain, uh, add to the rainfall for lots of reasons. It's a, it's a very endangered place environmentally, and with that danger maybe comes some kind of possibility for collaborative endeavors mm. that, that look at this. Um, and, and I want, I would, I would ask Sholem whether with his own turning, at least as a, as an object of great interest towards this strain of American naturalist mysticism, whether he felt it was possible that in the same way that Zionism inherited the mantle of Kabbalistic energy to propel the creation of the state, arguably, in his thinking, to become one of the propul propulsive forces, whether there was a possibility that some, m however it manifested, spiritually conscious environmental activity might take some of that energy from the aspects of Zionism, which had become overly narrow and sectarian, and from that revitalize the project again in this other way, whether there is a way to think beyond the specifics of what Zionism became towards some involvement, engagement with the potentials of the potential of the land itself as a source of commonality rather than just division. If you just brought up how Jared Kushner could make that work, I, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> See that then you would have a hook for the yeah, book That's, by, by by disappearing. <laughs> yeah. George Prochnik, thanks so much for coming back on the Virtual Memories uh, Show. Thanks very much for having me again. I appreciate it. And that was George Prochnik, or as I call him, Anti Gill. His new book, Stranger in a Strange Land, Searching for Gershom, Sholem, and Jerusalem, came out in April from Other Press, and it is a blast. Uh, you should also get his previous book, The Impossible Exile, Stefan Zweig at the End of the World, also from Other Press. They are at otherpress.com. And once we wrap the main session, I asked George, so, who are you reading? If you want to hear his answer to that, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memories Show so you can get access to our monthly bonus podcast, Beer of a Square Planet. You can do that at patreon.com slash vmspod or at paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for supporters of the show, including that podcast, the patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, series of ebooks that I am one step closer to publishing, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and Support the art of fine conversation. Now, this one was recorded at George's home in Brooklyn. That cost an astonishing $21 in tolls, but I did find street parking near George's place, so yay for me. If you want to help defray some of the costs of the Virtual Memories show, and that includes travel, like I just mentioned, web hosting costs, equipment, 
and let's be honest, my time, uh, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. Special thanks go out to Kevin Katila, John Wendler, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Wallace Wilde Manozzi, Andrew Mason, Greg Tanner, Garrett Zecker, Craig P. Steffen, and Ron Slate for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories show. We have the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Our music for this episode is Nothing's Gonna Bring Me Down by David Bayerwald, used with permission from the artist. David's got a reunion project going with his great 80s band, David and David, that made the wonderful album Welcome to the Boomtown. You can find out more and support that at facebook.com slash David and David Music. And that's it for this week's Virtual Memories show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with Vanessa Sinclair, a psychoanalyst, witch, and cut-up poet. Trust me, it all fits together. Until next time, you can subscribe to the Virtual Memories show and download past episodes at the iTunes store or at soundcloud.com slash vmspod. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, and at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com. Oh, yeah, there's a YouTube page also, but the URL is completely crazy. So go to YouTube.com and search Virtual Memories Show, and you'll find 50 or 60 past episodes there. Uh, they're not video. It's just a still picture and the audio, but people seem to dig that. So if that's your way of listening to podcasts, go to YouTube and search for the Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this show, please go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and review for this podcast. That'll help us build a bigger audience. Till next time, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way.